Happy New Year on behalf of the school committee. Welcome to our community conversation on the future of Holliston High School. My name is Stacy Raffi. I'm one of the school committee members. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank HCAT. Um, they are really great partners with the school in that they broadcast all of our meetings, our special events, and they stream it live on Facebook so that people who are unable to leave the house can actually watch it at home. So um, to Bruce Gilfoy and his team, we really, really appreciate your partnership. So this evening, Dr. Jackson is going to give you a presentation um, on the history of the high school and where we'd like to uh, move forward. Then the school committee members will each give you um, a brief comment or two about our own perspective about this and why we voted for a statement of intent last year. And then we'll open it up to questions. Um, some of us actually have computers in front of us, and that's because people had asked if they could email in questions to us, people who are actually um, traveling out of state. So a couple of us will, will have computers that we're, we're taking notes or answering questions. Um, and then we also have um, a note chart where we'll be um, taking notes and, and whatnot. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the superintendent of schools, Dr. Brad Jackson. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I appreciate you coming out tonight. Welcome to Holliston High School. Um, and um, um, hopefully there are some graduates maybe in the audience. Anybody who's graduated from Holliston High School? Jay, couple, welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back. Um, so basically, um, this is a presentation that I gave the school committee um, almost a year ago today to begin a conversation about the uh, future of Holliston High School. And um, that conversation has proceeded for about a year to the point where the school committee wants to begin to engage the greater community in that same conversation. So they asked me to give this presentation again, both primarily as a way to set a foundation for your conversation and your questions um, as, as you as a community move forward. Um, so let me see. So Holliston High School opened in 1969, September of 1969. <coughs> Um, and it was renovated once in 2001, and um, we are here today in 2019, now 50 years after the school was originally built. Um, this is a picture of Holliston High School um, from the original architecture, um, architecture piece um, that was printed in 1967. So the process for de designing and building this school began in about 1966 um, and uh, begins with a process, um, as all school construction projects do, with an analysis of the use, the projected use of the building and um, designing a school around the projected use. That's a typical process when you're building a new school. So you basically do what are called education specifications, which talks about your program of studies, what are you going to be teaching, how are you going to be teaching it, and then building the school to meet those needs. So in 1967, excuse me, 1969, and this came directly out of the Holliston High School Program of Studies in 1969, there were about seven different paths, one, two, three, four, five, six different paths that students could follow here during their four-year trek in Holliston High School. Was, one was a, a standard math, science, and engineering college prep. Um, curriculum that included pre-engineering drawing classes and a class called technical electronics. Um, and of course, some sort of room or facility or um, um, un, um, design need to be built, needed to be built into the school to, so that we had a room we could teach technical electronics in. Then there was a liberal arts um, and apparently everybody who went into the liberal arts uh, back in 1969 became a teacher because it was called the liberal arts slash teacher training track where students had traditional math, science, English, and social studies. There was a technical school prep 
um, pathway, which was for students who were not um, planning on entering, um, were not pr planning on entering college, but entering a, a two-year technical school, where they received three years of drafting instruction in addition to English and social studies, et cetera, and also had that whatever technical electronics, but they had that course as a requirement as well. Or you would go directly to employment um, with a business education background, and those classes included three years of typing, um, a year of business math, um, bookkeeping one and two, shorthand one and two, and automated data processing. Now, I started, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a secret, I graduated from high school in 19, 75, I had to think about that. Um, and um, I'm not sure what, so I would have been a, an eighth grader when Halston High School opened. Uh, now I'm really aging myself. And I have no idea, and I worked for digital for 14 years after I graduated from Babson. And, and I, have, I know what ADP means, stands for, but I have no idea how you teach it at a high school level. I, yeah, you weren't even, thank you for sharing that, Miss. Um, thank you for sharing that you weren't even born at the time. I really appreciate the support. Um, there was also an industrial arts type of um, um, employment track for drafting, woodworking, general metals, one, two, and three, and general electricity, um, not the company, the, um, the course. And then there was a home economics track. Thank God for progress. Um, but where one would take home economics one and two, business math, three years of typing, um, record keeping, business psychology, consumer economics, home and family management. I could have used that course, my wife would tell you. Um, office machine training and model office. This is the school that Halston High School, this is the course of studies that Halston High School was built to deliver. Now, obviously our rooms are more flexible than that, but that just gives you an idea as to what the, what the um, state of the art, if you will, in education was in 1969. In May of 1998 through September of 2000, Halston High School received a $26 million renovation. At that time, we replaced the HVAC systems, the electrical, we received an electrical and plumbing upgrade, there was new building and fire alarms installed, and we installed internet connectivity in all of our classrooms. Um, we did add several new um, um, areas. We built a dark room for, a, for our art slash photography class, which now we've reconverted back into a classroom because of digital photography and students don't um, process um, uh, film uh, anymore. Um, we added the central office wing at the far end, at the, at the, um, the, um, the far end of the building, farthest away from here. That's where uh, my office and my staff's office is located. Um, we actually also, there's one thing missing here, we added we didn't add space, but we took some existing space from the library and converted it into the studio for HCAT, right? That was added at the time as well. Um, again, it, wasn't, it didn't add to the footprint. The only addition to the footprint that was made in 19, in that renovation, was the central office um, uh, space that was added. Um, the building did receive cosmetic improvements. We replaced the floor and ceiling tiles, replaced all the carpeting, much as it is, um, we replaced all the student lockers. They put in and installed a new field house floor. We reupholstered these chairs, um, and uh, we put in. All, we bought all new classroom furniture and painted the entire building. Um, and we also spent 1.075 million dollars on desktop equipment, which primarily were Intel Pentium, Intel Pentium 3 which were seven, at the time 700 megahertz processors. Um, and then we spent $1,453.78 per unit. That was back in 2001. Um, and it's notable because this is pre-Title V um, regulations, uh, there was no upgrade or uh, modification to our on-site septic system or leaching field. Um, 
not to bring it, not to pick at an old wound, but the reason that was is that because the town at the time was kind of at a fork in the road trying to decide about sewers and, and its future and decided to, um, to let that conversation complete itself um, and decided not to, um, to um, do any improvements to the septic and sewer system, on-site septic system here. So fast forward to um, 2019. Um, while we maintain um, and have an active and um, aggressive maintenance program for this school, um, there are some infrastructure needs that are starting to show their, um, show those needs. And this is a list, and I know it's very small on your, um, excuse me, Eloise. I know it's very small on your um, print here, and uh, this, uh, we will post this um, presentation online um, um, later this evening. I'll see if we can do it later this evening or first thing in the morning. Um, we have a 50-year-old septic system that um, has been struggling. Um, we are, uh, and this is, so this is a list of our best estimate as to the, the short term, which is we define as zero to 10 years, improvements that we, that we will need to make to this facility. We have a 50-year-old septic system. Um, we, um, that would not, obviously not pass Title V requirements. Um, and um, we, um, at the top of that list, would be to replace it either with a wastewater treatment facility or um, secondarily, another option that's been bandied about is to basically connect Holliston High School to the water treatment facility that is associated with the Adams, Placentino, and Miller School um, and uh, pump to that um, site. Um, I don't have an estimate for the cost of that, um, and I would leave that estimate to others, um, but I, it certainly doesn't sound like a small investment one way or the other. Um, when this school, this school has all original windows, single pane windows that basically leak hot, well, cool air in the, in the winter time and leak hot air in in the spring and fall. Um, the only double pane windows we have are, again, in the, in the, um, the new construction that was uh, built in 2000. Um, the committee uh, field turf and track, um, that turf was installed um, just at the tail end of the, uh, actually it was after the renovation was completed. Uh, it was installed in 2005, I believe. Um, so it's 13 years old. Those, those um, uh, fields are expected, have an expected life of 10 years. Um, we, through an aggressive maintenance program, we've been able to maintain it to the point where it is um, still safe for our student athletes to use. But over the next 10 years, we don't expect that it would, it's reasonable to expect a field that is now 13 years old um, that has an expected life of 10 years when you installed it to last another 10 years beyond where it is. Um, we have been um, receiving a lot of feedback about the, um, I won't call it the safety, but I'll call it the um, comfort of students and staff during the September and June months when um, this unair conditioned school, although this, uh, this, this um, room is air conditioned, uh, but all of our classrooms are not. The second floor it, um, wing, which houses our foreign language, English, language, English and social studies um, teachers for the most part, is burdens, burdensomely hot when it gets hot in the summer, um, in June, and uh, similarly in September. And our library media center is also not um, air conditioned. And we've provided a rough estimate of about a million dollars to, um, to air condition that second floor. Um, Holliston in general, and Holliston High School specifically, has a shortage of field space. Um, we were able to um, fix some of those issues when we converted committee and field to a turf field, um, but our long range plan has always included a second turf field um, where we can have 
use for practices off and off also offload some of the um, some of the usage of committee and field it gets a lot a lot of usage um, our field house um, which is an original um, part of our structure the walls both on the interior and exterior they um, are have degraded they are actually metal panels in um, um, that are um, um, sandwiched, uh, the two metal pa panels, an internal panel and an external panel, and between them, in some cases, in is insulation. In other cases, that insulation has um, been um, removed by, um, frankly, by birds that got into there. We keep removing the birds, and they keep taking the, um, uh, the insulation for nesting materials. Um, those walls, are, again, are 50 years old, um, and um, are the interior, the exterior uh, walls will need some replacing. Our field house track is, again, 50 years old, and um, we replaced two years ago through the generosity of the Holliston Youth Basketball Group and um, donations from perhaps many in this room. We did spend $125,000 and replaced the main court of our, of our field house with a wooden floor. Um, it, it is a rubber, the entire um, field house surface is a rubberized surface, um, which was um, um, determined to be very unsafe, particularly for our basketball athletes, was causing a lot of um, knee problems, and um, so we replaced it with a more um, durable uh, wood surface, um, but the remainder of that track, um, again, has reached its useful life, life in 50 years. If you walk through the first floor hallways, our, our, um, our, all our tiles, this is a very moist school. Um, there is a lot of moisture in the air, particularly in the summertime, because it is an unair conditioned building, um, the moisture and the humidity builds up inside um, there was also some, some um, and I was not here at the time, but there was some talk that the, when the tile was installed on the first floor, it, the um, adhesive was not given a proper amount of time to, um, to cure before the tile was put down. We are, the, the VCT, the tile, is coming up um, and would need, will eventually need to be replaced. The boilers are 50 years old, the, fi the roof, um, has um, areas where that need replacement. This is a facility that does not offer, although we offer tennis to our athletes, we do not have um, tennis courts on our property. It's, um, with the exception of hockey, um, it is the only sport that, um, where students cannot play their home, um, turn home games um, at their school. Um, and um, our kitchen equipment, again, there's pieces of it that are 50 years old. So over the next, 10 years, we are expecting that we, we're currently estimating that we're gonna have to spend plus or minus over $11 million just to keep this facility usable uh, as we move on. So that is some of the concerns we have with the building itself. Um, and, but that's just half of the picture. Before, I think the community needs to decide how do we address these issues. Um, we also, I, I think it's important that we take a look at this building through the eyes of its use as an educational facility. You know, we can talk about boilers, we can talk about roofs, we can talk about walls, we can talk about fields, we can talk about boilers and septic systems, but this is, after all, an educational facility, and we need to evaluate, in my view, this high school against a, the current needs of our 21st century learner. When you saw the program of studies I talked about earlier, um, today's educational environment is much different than that, not just in the type of course offerings we have, but in the type of instruction that um, our students receive. This school and schools, all schools 50 years ago were built for this type of format, for one person to stand up in front of a group of people with a, in front of a lectern and, and share information. That's what school was 50 years ago for the most part. 
Now we've become more student-centered we, as opposed to teacher-centered. We're more project-based. We need opportunities for students to collaborate and meet together and have small group meetings and those types of things. Our classrooms are not built in any flexible way. All of our walls are permanent. Um, most schools that have been built in the past 25 years use at least um, every other class or every third class has a removable wall so that you can take one classroom and turn it into a larger meeting space. None of our classrooms offer that opportunity. They are all brick walls on four sides and, and they have some, um, they are very inflexible. Um, we don't always need 900 square feet, which is the size of a typical classroom. Um, you don't always need 900 square feet for um, certain special education programs. Some you could use less, some you need bigger classrooms to do that. In terms of the arts and music, um, you know, you obviously, and we do have two large um, rooms, one for the band, one for chorus. Um, but you could also use smaller spaces for small group instruction, for practice space, et cetera. Engineering and ro robotics, where you're actually using our old um, metal shop, um, where we've basically removed all the equipment and are using that for engineering and robotics. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but one of our big projects over the past two years is that um, as part of our um, program of studies, we have students that are building a tiny house um, which uh, we are going to then, once they're completed, they're, we're going to um, not raffle it off, but we're going to sell it um, to hopefully to a member in the community in accordance with Mass General Laws. We have to do it that way. Um, but that project right now is on hold because they need to put the roof trusses in and there's no space that is high enough to put the roof trusses in. So we've built the 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 bottom part of it, now we have to move it outdoors to put the roof trusses on, and we obviously can't do that. And we can't have students working outside or in this type of weather. So that project's on hold until the spring when we can move the tiny house outside. This is, this, none of these in and of themselves are reasons to do one thing or another, but they are just examples of how education has changed over the past 50 years and how your facility can limit or can support your, your instructional environment. Um, I would, um, this building was built um, with the energy expectations of 1969 um, and um, I asked my mother, she tells me that gas was about 29 cents a gallon back there. I don't remember that because I didn't pay for it. Um, but this building obviously with the single pane windows um, is very ener energy inefficient. It is also a very sprawling building. As you, I mean, this is a building that has a very, very, very large footprint for its capacity, which is about 850, 900 students. So, most buildings that are built in the past 25 years actually use a smaller footprint and go up three levels, and which is much more energy efficient because you allow, because of the heat rising. Um, our boilers are actually over in the field house. Those are the only boilers in this school. And we have forced hot water heat that has to make its way all the way over to the science wing to heat that part of the school. So you can imagine the heat loss that's taking place trying to move hot water from the field house over to the science wing. The, um, the new, the, super, the central office has its own rooftop units, so it's separately heated. So at least we didn't um, impinge on that piece. However, I can assure you as someone who uses the kitchen and bathroom in the central office a lot, hot water never makes it that far down um, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to that part of the building. There's, there's some construction challenges around four corners. I don't know if you've walked through this school at when, when classes are changing, but there is essentially two main corridors on the first floor that meet in, a, in and they form what we call four corners. And I've almost lost a limb walking through there at the wrong time. 
I'm being facetious, of course. But again, it's a, it's, it wasn't well designed. And primarily, as you saw, some of the issues that I um, outlined that could use some land support, the, um, the current, the, the size and the expansive building design really wastes land. This is a fixed footprint of land that the um, school lands, uh, lays on. We are using every square yard that we can um, for either field space, parking space, or the school. Um, and um, part of it, you know, there's two large um, uh, courtyards right outside the uh, thing that is, that with the exception of those which um, uh, aren't, don't get a lot of use, um, this, uh, again, it's, um, the building design is very, very large. Uh, we talked a little bit about athletic facilities. Um, our athletic program, we, are, we have students um, who are uh, participating in two and three sports at this school. Um, we are proud to be able to offer freshman, JV, and varsity programs where enrollment um, and, and um, where interest um, lies and they are all competing for the same space, the same practice space, the same field space, um, and um, for um, games, essentially there's one field. Comedian Field um, is where we play all the football games in the fall, all the boys soccer games, girls soccer games, um, field hockey games. In the spring, they're fighting the boys lacrosse, the girls lacrosse, our tennis, te uh, not a tennis, excuse me, our track, track team are all um, competing for that same single space. Well, again, we don't have any tennis courts. And I have to tell you, um, today's student is much different than they were when I was a student. And um, uh, the, the use of our fitness room is probably one of the most popular and well-used facilities in this school. It is used before school. It is used after school till four, five o'clock. We have, we have um, staff there that are supervising that, whether they be coaches or other staff. Um, and that fitness space is very small and used a lot. Um, and uh, again, we could use, we could double that in size and um, it would be used by our students. Um, our science labs are 50 years old. Um, they are, um, uh, they have not received any significant upgrade since uh, they were originally built. The school doesn't have a black box theater, um, which, is a custom, which is a common um, concept in uh, high schools in the past 25 or 30 years. It essentially is a small performance space this type of meeting would actually be just about the right size for a black box theater, maybe 150 seats, something a little more intimate and where you don't have to put on, I mean, we, we're high school, we put on a big musical, this place is filled, if we do a few drama presentations, um, you know, the, the, the usage is, is less so. Um, you need a large space where you can put essentially your entire student body in like this, but um, a black box theater is helpful. Our drama program now actually makes their own black box theater by converting this stage. Um, so they, they put on a small performance on this part of the stage and actually they clear the rear part of the stage uh, and on three sides they put seats to create a little theater in the round concept and they do their performance there. Um, which is actually extremely clever and very well thought of, and it is a nice intimate setting. But again, it's not, it's something we have to basically shut down the auditorium so that we can convert it into a black box theater for that time. Um, I dare say in 1969 when this school was designed and the traffic flow was designed for this school, um, the number of students who drive to school was a fraction of the number of students who drive to school today. The number of students who are driven to school was a fraction of the number of students who are, who are being driven to school today. The traffic, the 
cars and buses coming in and out of this site um, is probably, this is an estimate, I have no data to support it, but it's in my mind three to four times the amount of traffic that it was designed for. We are, we, and um, that it, we don't have enough parking, uh, which is another problem. Uh, because again, all of our many of our students um, are driving to school. Um, we talked about the small group meeting space. This is for students to meet um, in a small group. Um, right now, we kind of try to cordon off pieces of the library. When there's a class being using it on one side, we try to allow kids to take a couple of tables and and sit down together. But um, and I have to tell you, the best improvement we have made to this school in the past decade, and I encourage you to look at it as you leave here, are those half a dozen high top round tables that are in the, ba the back of the corridor back there. Those are used from 6.45 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Monday through Friday. Every time I walk through this school, there are students seated at that, whether singularly or together. Um, that has, that is probably one of the most popular spaces in our school. One of the things that um, would never be, actually I don't know if it's spe uh, specifications, but is very uncommon, particularly in schools that are built today or in the past 25 years, over a dozen of our classrooms are interior spaces. They have no windows. Um, all of our science labs have no windows. Every one of our science labs. Um, these students are attending 84 minute periods. Um, I, um, I, I, well, you draw your own conclusions. I, I can't, my ADHD would never allow me to sit in a, cla sit in a classroom without a window to at least look out um, to keep my attention focused. We don't have adequate storage. Um, and teacher and administration space, inadequate parking. And our network bandwidth, um, even though we keep trying to upgrade it and upgrade it and upgrade it, um, we have plenum wire running down the main corridors. Um, you know, we are now, we're in 2001, we basically had all those Intel Pentium 3 processors that we had to um, control through internet. Uh, and through those um, types of uh, devices. Now we've got almost a thousand handheld devices that need access to the internet on a timely basis. Um, we are a one-to-one -one school. Um, beginning next year, we will be a fully transitioned one-to-one -one school where each student at Holliston High School receives a Chromebook when they enter grade nine and we have essentially 800 uh, Chrome, we will next year have 800 Chromebooks um, uh, trying to access the internet potentially at the same time. Now this is my opinion and I've been asked by some to take this out but it's my opinion. To me, Halston High School was designed for this type of education it was renovated for that type of education, but we want to use it for this type of education. And we are seeing a lot of limitations around that. So combined, I feel this community is facing a challenge. This community is facing a challenge in that we have a 50-year-old school that needs some investment over the next 10 years, arguably, 10 plus million dollars, you can quibble with one project or another or the estimate of the cost of one project or another, but a 50 year old school um, is going to need and is going to continue to need investment. Um, and it's a school that where it's, where, that does have some, present some challenges and some limitations in the current instructional model that is being employed here in Halston and across Metro West. So to me, the question is, what's the best way for Holliston to address the physical plant needs and the educational def deficiencies that currently it's exist in the high school? And to me, the options are simple. You address them separately or you address them together. 
Or I guess there's a third option, which is you don't address them at all. And that's certainly an option that's available to the community as well. And I should add that there because I don't want to um, eliminate options for your consideration. And I think that's a very difficult decision to make. Um, and there will be a lot of questions, there'll be a lot of comments, there'll be a lot of um, um, concerns addressed about what may perhaps about some of the things I've said tonight. <clears throat> but to me, um, you know, I'm just trying to provide this community with my professional opinion and uh, to give you a, an opportunity to start asking some questions. Um, but as Holliston High School faces this fork in the road, whether it be two or three pronged, do nothing, address issues separately, address it more comprehensively, you certainly shouldn't be um, relying on my professional judgment um, alone to be making this critical decision. I believe this community needs some data, needs more than just what I'm providing, but needs a professional review of this facility, both from an infrastructure point of view and from an educational needs point of view. Um, and that's called the feasibility study. Um, and that, um, but I think, and Halston can go off and spend two or three hundred thousand dollars on a feasibility study and have your answer as to what your options are and um, allow the community some basis for debate and discussion and decision making. Um, and, um, or you can also um, consider a partner. Mass the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has something called the Massachusetts School Building Authority, which partners with ta local towns um, and who are considering school projects, school construction projects, whether they be repairs, major repairs, renovations, or new builds. The MSBA doesn't just do new construction. They don't just do renovations. They don't just do, they also do accelerated and major repair support. The Massachusetts School Building Authority. <coughs> oh, and before let me let me talk to you a little more specifically about what a feasibility study is. Again, it's a more professional look than what I'm able to provide um, about options, solutions which include cost estimates to a school's deficiencies and issues. It will also either validate or disagree or add to some of the deficiencies that I argue exist um, and um, through, a, through these, profession, these professionals who do this work every day. Um, it includes an engineering study which basically means an HVAC person comes in, looks at your boiler, says, you gotta get rid of the whole thing, or you can replace this or that, um, and uh, you can get 10 more years, or 20 more years, or five more years. Um, and it also include, would include the professional review of your septic system, and waste removal plan, and um, your, uh, building alarm, your building security. It's actually an issue that we haven't identified here as a, uh, as a need, but one that is starting to percolate in this community. This is a school that has no, essentially, has little to no um, security infrastructure. We've got our buzzer system at the front door. All our other doors are locked. There's no, um, we don't have a closed circuit um, uh, video camera. Um, set up for um, external um, uh, review and um, um, supervision of our, of our property, um, uh, nor are there any um, inside the building at all. And I'm not advocating for that, by the way, but uh, there are people who uh, believe, that, you know, who, who consider that to be a deficiency. It's, this work is performed by a qualified architect who's actually vetted and selected um, on a selected list that's provided by the MSBA. So it's not, you know, um, my buddy or somebody I've worked with in the past or 
um, somebody from, you know, who's a house architect, uh, with all due respect to people who build houses, it's a vendor that's qualified through the M by the MSBA and all of their subspecialists are also qualified by the MSP, pre-qualified by the MSBA. And they will produce a final report that says, these are the deficiencies that we see, these are the challenges that we, we see through, because they also bring educational consultants in to review your building use, how it's used, um, how your instructional, what your instructional model is, and these are your options for addressing this issue. From, and they will, that feasibility study will provide you all of the options and all of the costs, whether it be do nothing, do spot repair, replacement of, of um, infrastructure, do a wholesale renovation to the, um, to the final option, which of course at some level could be um, either replacing some or all of this building. So the MSBA is actually funded by a one cent surtax on your on the 6.25 percent um, sales tax, and that's actually wrong now because the sales tax. Oh no, it's sales tax, not the the. It's not the income tax. It is still a 6.25 percent sales tax. So it is funded through your um, through the sales tax um, in Hollist, in Halston and throughout Halston, and they those monies. Um, are used statewide to support building projects, school building projects across the state. Um, they collaborate with, and this is off their website, they collaborate with municipalities to invest in finding the right sized, most fiscally responsible and educationally appropriate solutions to create safe, sound and sustainable learning environments. That's their mission. They will contribute a minimum, if you qualify, they will pick up a minimum of 31% of the cost of any, of the feasibility study, of any qualified repairs, of any qualified re, um, renovations, or of the, of any decision to build part or new, or whole or part new. The state will pick up 31% of the cost. Right, and the way um, Ms. Hanstead was reminding me that we enter, you, and I'll go into the process of how you enter the school building, the MSBA process, but if you don't follow their process and get accepted, your project accepted by them, you don't get any reimbursement for anything uh, if you go forward and, and uh, have to do some replacements. So this is their process. It is hard to read on that. It's hard to read on the thing, and I tried three times today to get a better, this actually is a PDF that comes right off their site. The process begins with submission of a statement of interest. And I'll talk a little bit more about a statement of interest first. If the MSBA accepts your statement of interest and accepts your project to go into the feasibility um, phase, um, then, then, you, um, then you must vote at the local level to appropriate your portion of the feasibility study cost. If you do that, you conduct the feasibility study, you, they select, they help you select a solution, you select it and, and then the community again has an opportunity to say, this is what we want, this is what we don't want, we don't want to fund it, we do want to fund it. Typically, it would, that would require, at a minimum, a vote of the annual town meeting or a special town meeting, and would invariably, anything, even the, the $10 million of, of, of projects, would in all likelihood require some sort of Prop 2 and a half override. So that would also require the citizens to go to the ballot at a local, at a locally called election or the annual town election to approve that. So the, the voters get a number of different opportunities to weigh in and say, yes, 
I want to spend the money? No, I don't. Um, and once you fund the project, essentially that's when you go forward with the, with the um, design and construction completing the project. So there is, it's a very long process. How do we find out? Well, we submit a statement of interest. And a statement of interest is basically a form that I submit that outlines what are currently perceived to be the deficiency of the building and how those deficiencies fit within the priorities established by the, by the MSBA. There are two, four, six, seven deficiency areas that they'll um, support um, and they'll consider statements of interest. Um, some of the, the ones that are bolded, the modernized building systems to increase energy conservation or decrease energy cost, and building no longer provides for the full range of programs consistent with state and local educational requirements. Those are the two um, um, priorities that I believe our project or our needs meet. Um, we don't have enrollment growth issues. Um, we are not currently facing a loss of accreditation. Um, we don't, we are not anticipating significant overcrowding in the future. We have a very stable student population, um, K to 12. Um, and we're not currently overcrowded and our building is not structurally unsound. So those other five we would not qualify for. Um, it is a statement of problem only. And there's no, there is absolutely no cost to submit it. I submit it. Um, and um, we submitted to the S MSBA. There is a requirement that I receive permission in the form of a vote from the school committee and from the board of selectmen to authorize me to submit that on behalf of the town. Um, at this point in time, the school committee has voted to do that and we are waiting to hear back from the board of selectmen um, regarding their interest in, in um, in discussing this um, this year. Um, and this year, um, we have a deadline for submission in order to be considered for the 2019 calendar year. Um, we have to, it's actually April 9th, I think is the firm date where I have to submit the um, SOI. In October and November, we'll hear back from the MSBA Board of Directors whether or not Holliston will be invited into the eligibility period, which essentially says you've got, I forget the number of days, but it, I think it's 180 days to um, appropriate the money for the feasibility study or your portion of the cost of the feasibility study. If you don't, so that basically all that does is say you're, we're going to, we approve your project for the first phase. You've got 180 days to appropriate the money. If you don't, we're good. Well, they probably won't be happy, but we're, there's no harm, no foul in terms of costs for Holliston. Um, I have to tell you, this is extremely competitive. Um, there are an average of 100 to 125 statements of interest um, that are, I'm gonna move over here for a minute, so I'll turn that microphone off because I wanna get something, Lois. For 100 to 125 statements of interest submitted every year. Um, I have the data on what was submitted last year that I'll find in a minute. I wanted to, of those 100 to 125, um, approximately 20, only 20 are uh, invited into the eligibility period and the remaining 80 to 100 are invited to resubmit next year. It takes an average of four to five years, four to five submissions to kind of get at least to the point where you're being actively considered. Now, having said that, there is no guarantee. It, they could say, oh my gosh, your problem is Horrible, the worst in the state, it's not, um, it, by a long shot. Um, and, but um, they could say, okay, this year we'll, we'll accept it on your first um, request. 
That's very unlikely, but it could happen. It takes an average, as I said, three to five years. This year, um, um, this year they only received 70 statements of interest from 56 different school districts, um, and they um, only approved eight. I'm getting this off out of, this is a, something that was in the Lowell Sun, uh, because Chelmsford High School, they've been trying to, they've been on the, they've been submitting for three years and they're getting very frustrated. Stoneham High School, uh, Stoneham High School, after six submissions, finally got approved um, after six years of submission. So it can take quite a while. It typically takes longer for high schools because they only want, it, they are typically the more, the bigger ticket items. Um, and um, they, um, uh, so they typically um, only approve a couple of high schools a year. So an option for this community to consider is to submit, is to begin the process and say, hello, MSBA, we're out here. We want you to, to look at our problem, give us some feedback, see what you think, maybe invite us into the, to the next phase, maybe not. Um, but will at least give us some helpful feedback in terms of um, where our need um, is ranked um, relative to other, the other communities in Massachusetts. You're paying your taxes in, to pay a penny on your sales taxes going to the Mass School Business Authority to build schools, to renovate schools, or to do significant repairs to schools across Massachusetts. One of the purposes for me to, talk, to present to you tonight is to have you consider whether or not it's time for Holliston to, um, to try to take advantage of that program. So um, at this point in time, that's the end of my presentation. I'll turn it back over to Ms. Raffi and um, I'm gonna sit down and take my microphone off because it's gonna create a lot of feedback, isn't it? Great, thank you, Dr. Jackson. So as Dr. Jackson mentioned, the school committee had voted um, to approve the statement of interest. So I've asked the committee members to each give um, a minute or two to share with you why, um, why we're in support of, of submitting a statement of interest. So I'm gonna start on my right. Andy. Good evening, thank you all for coming tonight. It's nice to see such a, a, a big turnout. Um, my concerns around um, this process is we have an aging high school, we have some very clear needs um, with things that the high school doesn't do particularly well for our students. Uh, so looking at that, looking at the uh, over $10 million in upgrades that we need to consider over the next 10 years, uh, it's probably time for us to assess our needs to decide whether it makes sense to do those incrementally, whether it makes sense to do a major renovation or to do another um, route, which would likely be a construction project. So for me, it's the right time to consider uh, all of our needs, have that done by a professional, and then lay that out and weigh out what we'd like to do. At this point, there wouldn't be any cost for us to start the process. We know it's a lengthy process. Um, as, as Dr. Jackson said, it's potentially four or five years before we were considered. And then based on that, once we get into the process to decide whether it's going to be um, repairs, uh, a major renovation or a construction project, we're looking at potentially up to 10 years. So this is a process that I feel like every year that we delay is gonna put us significantly behind. So uh, that was why I voted to support this decision. Thanks, Andy. Andy is a, um, a high school teacher, so I really value his input. Um, he's, at, he's at Dedham, um, a much bigger community, different looking community, but I value his input when it, when it comes to this, and he's been a, a leader in this process. Um, I voted for the, to um, go ahead with the statement of interest because there's absolutely no risk involved with the statement of interest. 
The slide you saw, which you couldn't see very well, it's a PDF, which has eight steps to the building process. The statement of interest is before that whole thing. So if 20% of the communities are, are accepted, that's step one. So we're even pre-step one. There's no financial obligation to the town until we're in step one, and that is funding the feasibility study. That's what I want to look at, because if I have a car that has 85,000 miles on it, and the brakes are kind of going, and it probably needs new tires, I just want to bring it to the mechanic and say, is the suspension going? How's the engine? Should I get a new one that's more fuel efficient? This one has a CD player, I kind of want a thing. Can I drive this? You know, how much longer do I have? It's a cost benefit analysis. And that's all I want. We're not sitting in the Cadillac of high schools right now. We're in like a good year Ford, like a really good year for the Ford Explorer. That's what we're sitting in right now. So I want to know how much mileage do we have left on this? Should we, you know, replace the windows? Should we, what should we do? Um, about those eight steps, it's not until step four, the design phase, that the town has real financial um, vulnerability. You, you, we don't even put stakes in the ground to step four. And we are so many years away from that, as Andy said. The statement of interest doesn't even get us to the, to the starting line, never mind the 50-yard line. Um, and it's not until the sixth step that we're talking serious financial risk. At every stage until stage six, we can bail. We can say, uh-uh, this is too much for the town, we can bail. So that's why I voted for the statement of interest because it's, it's a no-brainer in my mind. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this one on? Yeah. Um, I'm Martha DeVoe, and I'm the parent of a high school senior. I'm probably the newbie on the school committee. I am only in my third year of my first term. So it was a little bit of a new process for me. And just for those of you who don't know, about two or three years ago, our Board of Selectmen had a consultant group come in, the Conley Group, I believe that was their name, to help the whole town start look at our short term, the one to 10, and the longer term capital needs of all of our organizations and buildings within the school, within this town. The school at that point in time, thanks to Mr. Bidet's leadership and Dr. Jackson's leadership, had a very comprehensive list of all of our buildings, all of our facilities, and all of our short-term and long-term capital needs. And of course, the high school, because it was renovated um, instead of totally rebuilt like all of the schools down on the Woodland campus, was probably the heaviest on that list as to what was needed for our projected um, improvements. At that point in time, the Conley consultant said, what's your plan for either repairs, renovations, or rebuilds? And the consultant that was working primarily with the Conley group at that point in time had a lot of experience from some other towns, particularly Newton, on looking at building renovations. And he really thought that the high school should really consider going through this process that Dr. Jackson has outlined. Because there is no financial commitment at the initial stage and because it is such a long-term process, I really supported that recommendation both last year and this year. What wasn't said tonight was we did go through this process last year and at that point in time we realized we probably needed to have much more broad community involvement and support and dialogue around this. So although the Board of Selectmen did not support going forward with the statement of, inter in statement of interest last year, we're ser seriously hoping that they will listen to our concerns and support and consider it for next year because it is a long-term process. And one of the values of going through the statement of interest process, as Dr. Jackson has outlined, is that each time your request is not selected for going forward, there's feedback that's given to you. And each time that feedback comes back to us, it gives us the opportunity to reevaluate how we're perceiving our process and our statement of intent and interest and refine it and look forward to it. And we can also monitor the other programs and projects that are being developed. Another process of going through the uh, Mass State Building Association. Um, Authority. 
authority process is they also have streamlined their design programs and often have kind of prefabbed or pre-planned proje projects that say a school of your town with such and such a size and such and such a revenue base or whatever and has certain kind of programs really fits this model or that model, which will help us streamline and have a much more efficient process. And then also, once we go through the feasibility study, having experts look at what our information is, what our building is, what our needs are, what they're seeing for other projects will help us have a more informed and more a thorough process, so I really feel that this is an appropriate first step for this community to take and consider and also work collaboratively with our Board of Selectmen and other parts of our town to understand our needs within the bigger context of this community. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it really is nice to see so many people turn out, and I think I see a few students sitting up there as well, um, which is really nice to see you uh, with some real interest in a building that you've uh, spent some time in here. Um, I'm Anne Louise Hanstead, and I, um, I'm, I'm on the opposite spectrum of serving. I'm in my seventh year now on the committee, and uh, I have um, served as chair of the committee at large, but also uh, chaired and participated on the budget subcommittee all seven years, and I'm currently chairing that. That has afforded me some perspective over time, um, but as well in a very detailed way um, to understand the real financial uh, management and obligations of the district. Um, and in particular, the capital planning. So I, I did just want to provide a little bit more context to what Martha said. So um, I actually uh, was at the table with Dr. Jackson and, and uh, Mr. Boudet and um, working closely with the Finance Committee on the capital planning process. It was a process that um, was launched to provide an overall perspective on the capital needs of the town. And I really applaud um, the town and the Finance Committee in particular in trying to pull that together so that we have a holistic view of the town's needs and can plan thoughtfully for how to address those needs because some of them are large. Um, and it was really through that process that we um, pulled together this extraordinarily detailed list from big things like the, the septic system here at the high school down to when we might need to repave sidewalks. Um, we, it was a very comprehensive review by our uh, district administration. And it was really through that process that we collectively sat back, and, and I'll fess up, it wasn't actually the Collins group that um, said stop, it was me, because this high school has been on my mind. I have three children who have um, enjoyed their educations here in the district, two of whom have graduated. I'm um, now with my third as a junior. And full disclosure, my children and we as parents will never see a direct benefit by making any improvements to this high school. Um, and it's through that eye that I offer you some objectivity because I am not um, insensitive to the questions that seniors may have around this or parents whose kids have already come through. You know, you, you've paid your dues. I understand that. Um, but I, I really had to step back. And when we looked at $11 million plus in costs that we can identify today that are not, um, it's not a question of if, it's a when. So we know at some point, as you might on your own home, that the roof is going to need to be replaced. And I see this as simply a question of prudent fiscal management and capital planning. It's, it's not, it, what we don't want to do is wait until there's a really significant, urgent problem. We're trying to plan ahead so that we don't run into a situation where we have to make some very urgent decisions um, with the town. We want to plan ahead. 
And in that light, forethought is, is something you put in the bank, if you will. So we decided um, with the Collins Group, they did suggest that we then consider partnering with the state. And there's significant advantage to doing so and a real downside to not doing so. So as Dr. Jackson said earlier, by kind of getting on the train and getting into the queue to submit this statement of interest, we eventually hope that we will be considered for a feasibility study. And that's only the first step on the journey. However, if we don't go through the process with the state, we can't get on that train later. We cannot go back after we ourselves conclude that there may be some reason we really need to make some sort of significant investment in this infrastructure, whether it's another renovation or something more, more significant. We can't go back to the state after we've done our own feasibility study or, or thought about what that project is and start over. It doesn't work that way. We can't recoup those investments, and you probably would unlikely you know, not consider repeating it, if you will, because there wouldn't be time. Um, so the first, the first thing here is that this just seemed to be a very prudent, fiscal, conservative approach to evaluating how best to address the needs of the high school. Um, the second thing is because the process is not a short one, you know, at best we might see some kind of uh, a feasibility study conducted with some kind of information and data in hand for all of us to at evaluate within four to five years, we're not looking at being able to make any decisions or changes or improvements in any time short of that. In that time, yes, we're going to have to make some investments in some of the items on that list, but there are going to be new things that come up. And that concerns me. It concerns me that we could be five years down the road without a plan. Mm -hmm. And without a plan, we can't come up with an approach that makes sense for the town. We can't evaluate it in the context of other town needs. So at least having a feasibility study in hand that says, here are your options. You can do A, B, or C. You as a town can decide. Without that in hand, we have no information and we can't act responsibly. Um, so, you know, in addition to some of the other things that everybody else said, it's, it's been an interesting process. So this process began over two years ago with the capital planning process, and then we decided to bring it forward to our Board of Selectmen last year. The first step is largely an administrative one, submitting this statement of interest form. After that, we'll have a whole lot more information to share with you. Um, but it does concern me that as we start to look around communities that are um, like-minded communities in terms of education, the quality of education that they deliver and the resources that they put behind them, Holliston is going to begin to fall behind. And I don't know how to say it any other way. Today. I am so proud of this district and the education that my children have received. And we have extraordinary educators in the classroom, and make no mistake, that is where we put our money. It doesn't mean we put it there to the exclusion of maintaining these facilities, which in part is why people are asking questions. Well, why do you really need to do anything? It looks pretty good in here to me. Seats look great. Well, we, we renovated this room significantly 20 years ago. We maintain these schools to the best of our ability to make sure they are safe, secure, and, and providing a sound environment for our students. Um, but over time, this is changing. 95% of this facility and infrastructure is exactly what it was 50 years ago. The only new wing or facilities here are our, our central office. Um, so, you know, that in and of itself speaks to some of the challenges that we're dealing with. And if you, I, I, don't, I don't believe there's another community now within, I'm going to say, a solid 20 mile radius of us that doesn't have a new, new high school um, or that hasn't committed to it at this point. Um, 
So it's, you know, you look, you don't build a new house because your neighbors do. <laughs> but, um, but, it, but it's interesting to watch what's happening around us to see that, and that impacts your real estate values. There's no question about that. So it's something to think about. So if I have a stake in this as a parent moving forward, other than I highly value education, um, I do think twice now about my home and whether or not it'll command the same value as a home in Hopkinton, et cetera, when I go to sell it. And that's hopefully not happening tomorrow, <laughs> but, but it's a thought. So, um, so again, I, th I just think that this is a prudent thing to do. There is absolutely no risk in moving forward with the statement of interest. There's only benefit. Um, it gives us visibility, forward visibility, which, you know, I do, I, on my job, um, in my career, that's what you ask for when you're budget managing. You're looking for forward visibility so that you can make smart decisions. Thank you. Yeah. If I have that much more to add after all that. Um, I, we're looking at 11 plus million right now, just as you had said. And a few years from now, who knows what we could be looking at. So my concern is, as a, even as a taxpayer, is that well, we could be putting good money over bad. So I feel like it's most prudent for us to partner with the MSBA and to look to see what our options are rather than just kind of flying blind. So I just echo the same sentiments of my colleagues, um, mm -hmm. that that's why I voted for the statement of interest. And I think it's important for us to get some partnership. And I appreciate so much that so many people here that are interested in this project. So thank you for being here. Thank you. And the only other point that I would add, this is um, incredibly important to me because I think we need to really start looking forward and have some forward thinking about where the town is going in terms of our buildings, in terms of education, um, and this is the first step. And as people have alluded, I don't think any of our children would actually benefit in a new high school. I think they will have already graduated. So it, it's not about this is important to me because it will affect my child. It probably won't. So thank you for listening to us. And now we'd like to listen to you. So there will be a handheld mic um, going around the auditorium with Mr. McLeod. We just ask that you state your name and your address. This is a public meeting, so we just want it for the record. Um, but we are very interested in what people are thinking, questions that you have. If we can't answer it at the moment, we will obviously get back to you. Um, we have pen and paper up here. If people want to be added to the school committee newsletter and you're not already receiving it, we'd love to have you um, sign up for it. So you can either email any of us on the committee. All of our information is available on the district website under the school committee tab, um, or we can write it for you down here. So before we start questions, Martha, will you um, take some notes for us? And Mr. McLeod? Um, so please, please raise your hand and Dan will walk over to you. Yeah, two of us. Hello, I'm Henry Powell, uh, 84 Maple Dell Lane. Um, so I was a senior here last year. I'm at UMass now, yay. Um, and this is a lot of interesting stuff. It looks like it's definitely the right call to, uh, to take this path of, of better understanding our problems. But I just wonder about some of the, uh, the short-term infrastructure needs. I was here for four years. And things like uh, the, the field turf and track, we talked about or there being a expected life of 10 years for these things. And I'm just kind of wondering where we're getting that number from. So if we're 15 years past where it should be and it maybe doesn't look all that bad, is the original 10-year estimate accurate? So I don't know. Um, the air conditioning. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something we need. I can attest to that. It gets very hard to think when your brain starts to melt. Um, again, the turf and practice field. Um, in wet conditions, I can understand that can be an issue. But a lot of the time, it's not all that bad. We've gotten pretty good at having droughts. Um, 
So, and it, it's just things that I think would be cool to think about more, and I, I assume we would. Um, but I'm probably not going to get to say this later because I'll be at college. Um, the field house is also something that I, I, I wonder how much uh, work that really needs. Um, the auditorium, a, a lot of these things, I just I were a little, I, I questioned to some extent. But then things like the, the wastewater treatment, I've, I've tasted the water once or twice, it, it needs work. Um, and then regarding the, the steps of this research, we've kind of, it was, we were given some numbers, but I feel like if it's something that so many other high schools have done, we should have a better idea of the, the lengths of each specific step, going from one step to another step, how long does that realistically take? Um, and then the, the one worry I have is that if we go through it, after all that, are we going to worry that we will be forced to follow through with things, even if we say we have the options? I just wonder if, if kind of sunk costs will push us around or something. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Henry, that was great. I'm going to ask something whenever anybody gets up, if you could just stand so I can see you. Those are really great questions, and I'm totally impressed. They're coming from a high school student, so I'm a little afraid now what the adults are going to going to ask. Um, Brad, do you want to, I, I could address some of these, but I, I feel like you're the subject matter expert. Do you want to try to take them or do you have a mic there? Because I can give you this. I, um, well, I wasn't, um, I, I, again, I don't think the issue of, um, you know, whether one thing belongs on the list or the other is Actually, that's kind of the argument that I'm making is that it's just my list and that it's a list that needs to be reviewed and the, the school needs a comprehensive review by experts. Um, now, I've been a business manager for 10 years before I became a superintendent. I've done a lot of building repairs. I've done a lot of building construction. I've probably been responsible as a building administrator for probably $150 million worth of school projects over the course of my career, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not an expert. Um, whether the number is 5 million or 10 million or 15 million, it's a lot of money. And um, so, again, this is more, you know, if the community wants to invest in these repairs, one by one, that's fine. Um, but I just think, um, you know, the opportunity to look at this more holistically and also to try to reach out to partner with the state who will pick up a minimum of 31%. Um, and that number could be in the high 30s, low 40s, um, depending on a number of factors that they go through and, um, and analyze for you. Uh, during the process, um, you know, I, I, my, my basic premise is, it's worth asking the question and reaching out to the state. Um, you asked a couple of specific questions, Henry. Let me see if I can try to answer those. So you, you talked a little bit about where some of the lifetime estimates are coming from, and also the cost of repairs, et cetera. Um, those are good questions because. Whenever you invest in something, whether it's the track, the new basketball court, or what have you, um, typically when you're working um, with a vendor or a provider, et cetera, um, they may or may not come with a warranty. Um, often they do. Um, but typically an asset will come with an expected life. So they'll say, well, the expected life of this asset is X. So you buy an automobile. The expected life is, you know, somewhere between 100,000 miles and more. Um, and so an auto manufacturer will give you warranties up until a certain point. And after that point, the vehicle will continue to work, hopefully, um, but you may be out of warranty. And it's the exact same thing with things like the track. 
so get the, the manufacturer of the turf or et cetera will give you a 10-year warranty or whatever it is. And once you start to go beyond that, um, it, it doesn't mean you can't use it. It doesn't mean it's not in good condition. It may well be, and, and if we maintain it well, we hope we get a little bit more life out of it. Um, but you kind of know you're on borrowed time. So I hope that answers a little bit for you because we do track the expected life of all of our assets, and those are in the capital planning uh, management uh, sort of uh, budget analysis uh, spreadsheet that we've got. Um, in addition to that, when we look at anticipated repairs, um, that process is actually interesting at a municipal level. In the, in the sort of private sector, we just go out and get an estimate or, or we'll have a contractor look at it. Um, because um, in the world of municipal finance, um, above a certain amount, you have to go through a bidding process. Um, so, so that can complicate things. So before we go through a formal bid process, we may get a couple of sort of estimates in on something if we know we're going to have to repair it in the near term, if you will. If it's a really big project like repair, like replacing the roof or the septic, then um, before we're really ready to commit to something like that, we may get round estimates by talking with other districts who have recently been through a similar project, and they can offer us insight on, you know, is it bigger than a bread bread box smaller than a Mack truck, like what are we looking at in big round numbers for a particular project? And that helps us just kind of gauge how much investment we may need to be considering for something. Um, but as we get closer to a project, as it becomes more real, we will get more formal estimates and ultimately go into a bid process. Does that answer some of your specific questions around this? Okay. Um, I did want to point out, we have two, I mentioned them earlier a little bit, but we have two of our school committee student representatives here. And girls, I don't know if you could just introduce yourself and give a big high five. Come on, say hi. The mic is right. Coming to you. Uh -oh. Hi. I'm Sarah O'Neill. I'm the student committee representative, and this is Elise. She's not, but I'm she's not. really You're interested. Not. <laughs> um, so since I have the microphone, I do have a question. So you guys discussed potentially submitting a statement of interest. If this does not go through, or for whatever reason it's not formally considered, what short-term um, options will be considered to address the immediate issues? How will you be determining which ones should be prioritized above others? And will there be a cutoff when you guys just say, hey, we need a new school, we can't just pour money in, like Henry said, and not get any results and lose money. The, um, okay. <laughs> so the way the, first of all, the, I think if, if we were to be able to go ahead and submit a statement of interest and it gets denied, which frankly would be our anticipation, at least in the first year, then our hope would be to resubmit the following year. It's an annual process. In the meantime, we work closely with the, um, with the uh, Finance Committee to evaluate our capital needs and requirements. And every year, that process is evaluated pretty much as part of the special fall town meeting and will submit requests that are our highest priority. Those priorities are influenced um, in part by the capital planning process and hopefully we're able to address things again with visibility and forward thinking like you know this has been on the list for three years it's coming up and we think this is our most important thing or these three things are important but there are always instances where you you may have to rejuggle those priorities because something else became more urgent and if it does then we have to reevaluate those priorities so as part of the whole budget planning process um, the school committee evaluates that in the context of all of our needs. We have a discussion with the finance committee. We vote on them. Um, we'll advocate for what we believe the district needs, and hopefully they get approved and we go forward. There was another question right up front here, Dan. <clears throat> Hi. I'm, oh, sorry, guys. I'm Kylie Williams. I'm at 30 Foxwood Cove. Um, I have a sophomore here at the high school, and I have a sixth grader and an eighth grader. Um, I have been directly involved in the construction of public schools in Massachusetts for most of my career. Um, so I can tell you 
firsthand without a doubt. We definitely need a new high school. Um, I can see, I, I, I see, I know what goes into building a 21st century school. I'm working on one right now in Brookline. Um, our school is lacking tremendously. Um, I'm fully in support of a new school. Um, and I also believe it's a no-brainer to submit the SOI because there is no risk at this point. Um, to get our, our, the answers that we really need and to really find out what we need beyond Dr. Jackson's list of you know, what he's created is really that feasibility study um, from MSBA and the, with the help of MSBA through the professionals. Um, that can really evaluate our school and compare our needs um, to, to other schools, uh, other districts that are similar to ours. Um, so with that said, there is one thing that, um, dis that that's disturbing to me, um, and it's something that you know, just this week alone, twice I've heard um, from some parents who, I, I don't know if it's a perception, be, I don't know, it, it, it's a, there's a perception um, that the schools that we currently have aren't being maintained. So why should we build a new school if that one's not gonna be maintained? Whether that is um, perception is based in reality or whether it's just something that they've seen, I don't know. Um, this is new to me, frankly. I'm just asking this. So my question is this. Um, I'd like to know what the current maintenance programs are that we have for our schools. Um, I'd like to know, um, you know, if, if you've heard the same thing, if, if you feel that we have maintenance issues at our schools, or um, I know we have a 50-year-old school, so, you know, no matter how hard we maintain a 50-year-old school, it's birds are going to use the insulation and metal panels. That's just what they do um, when they can get to them. Um, so I'd like to hear about our current, current maintenance programs. Um, the feasibility study will likely evaluate our past maintenance programs, mm -hmm. what we're currently doing. Um, and one thing I can say uh, with regard to maintenance is through the development of a new school, which I think is going to get us um, the best bang for our buck rather than do a whole bunch of piecemeal fixes. Um, through the development of a new school, we will get um, a very comprehensive operations and maintenance program. Um, we certainly can dictate uh, what we're looking for, certainly with the guidance of an OPM, um, sorry, um, uh, owner's project manager, um, mm -hmm. would help us establish what uh, would be the best program for maintenance and operating um, our facilities. Um, but that, that new development would come with a very comprehensive maintenance and operations program. It would come with training from professionals who provide the equipment. Um, it would come with warranties and we as an owner can dictate uh, to a great extent what the terms of those warranties can be. Um, but but the, the key to that would be that we have to commit as a school district to following that maintenance program because there, again, is a perception right now that we're not taking care of our schools. And I'm afraid that there are going to be some voters who would vote against it because of that perception. So can you somebody address that? Yep, I'd be glad to. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to nominate Kylie Williams for a school committee. Um, the papers come out on April 1st. I'll, I'll be your first signature. Um, I have heard that, and we have heard that same feedback. And here, here's where I, I'm going to be very blunt. Um, I came on this committee five years ago, and when I came on, um, the first budget that I was to vote on, we were going to lay off 30 teachers, 30 staff members, paraprofessionals and staff members. And I remember pounding the table and getting close to tears and, and, and being very um, passionate about not letting that happen. And we worked with our partners in the FinCom and the Board of Selectmen, and, and that did not happen. Having said that, we have been in rebuild mode since 2008, 2009, and even since I got in this committee, we're still in rebuild mode. Having been on the budget subcommittee and past chair of the budget subcommittee, I will tell you that when I get a list of things that we have that we need, and the FinCom asks us to prioritize them, maintenance always gets cut. 
because when I first became a member and I went to the, the school committee uh, conference and they teach you how to be a school committee member, they tell you, this is, here's the bubble of what you, this is the scope. Here is what you, the nuclei is the classroom. And that is where you have to focus first. And then it goes like this. You know what's out here? It's, it's what we call co-curriculum, which is athletics, activities. And what comes over out here is buildings and grounds. So every year, our business manager says, I need this, 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 and this. And every year, we tell them, sorry, can't do it. The FinCom requires us to prioritize our spending. And you're never going to get me to say, I want a Kubota instead of a paraprofessional. It's not going to happen. In terms of, of what we're doing with our current maintenance program, we're understaffed. It is what it is. We've had to lay off. We used to have three full-time custodians at the high school. We don't have that anymore. So we're doing with what we have. We're doing with, you know, just like the teachers and the paraprofessionals, the maintenance people have been asked to do this much when their initial job was this. So that's really the reason. And I... I you know, recently, you know, the, the bird situation. I thought it was cosmetic. I voted against it. Because I didn't want to spend any money on something that was cosmetic. It was not structural. It faced, it doesn't even face the street. And I disagreed with my colleagues. I'm like, no, I don't want to fund that. Because I thought it was a waste of money. No. Nobody wanted to fund it. But the, the idea that we should be, I mean, that was cosmetic. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. But we're being criticized for not taking care of our property, of the property. But then that will be used against us and say, well, why'd you spend $1,000? That wasn't very prudent of you. So it's sort of, yeah, sign up for school committee. You'll learn how win-win how it is. <laughs> you know? um, but that, that's, does that answer your question, I hope? Um, and we do have a program, and, and um, Keith Boudet is our business manager. Um, originally, he was just the business manager, and then he was this and this. And now he, he doesn't have the, um, the um, IT portion of his job, but he still has two full-time jobs, and one of them is operations. So he is, and he's been here forever. He knows where all the bodies are buried. He knows what we need and what we don't need. And he's doing a bang-up job with what he has. But I, but I would also just, hold on, I yeah. just be clear. <clears throat> We maintain things such as boilers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's right. It's the cosmetic, like, I just want yeah. to be clear about your message. It's the cosmetic things that people perceive you are not taking care of them. Um, so, you know, the shutter might fall off my house and I might choose not to repair that because I'm worried about the electrical or, or whatnot. So, I just want to be clear about that. Um, I would like to have more questions. Um, I want to hear more from the community. No, I think so that, I'm was, gonna... that was what I wanted to say. There's a real difference between just the, you know, some of the basic maintenance. We need more help. We'd like to do a better job on keeping the parking lot clean, but the buildings themselves are not falling apart. Hi, thank you. Um, Gwen Erskine, 14 Rocky Woods Trail. Um, my question has to do with um, why did the Board of Selectmen say no last year? And second question is, are there any limitations to signing up with the, um, the state program long term? Yeah. But I do want to say the context of why. Last year we were very much under the gun and getting that <clears throat> statement of interest reviewed by the school committee was very close to the deadline. So we really didn't have a lot of time to dialogue and work closely with the community, with the FinCom, and with the Board of Selectmen. So part of it was on our onus. We were very much close to the deadline, and it became a very rushed process. So that being said, I think the Selectmen, when they heard us out, it was a little bit at the last minute. And um, I would defer to them to, to answer that. But I think, in all fairness, it was something that was kind of rushed and didn't have a lot of dialogue with us within FinCom and the Board of Selectmen, and which is why we voted much earlier this year and are trying to get much more dialogue within the community so there's at least awareness in the community of this process 
as well as the Board of Selectmen so that it isn't something that is happening without people knowing about it. So that being said, I wanted to provide my context. Uh, Jay Marsden, uh, 32 Wendy Lane, uh, uh, Chairman of the Halston Board of Selectmen. Uh, Martha's spot on. It was a sort of a, a, a last minute request, if you will, and uh, the school committee had done some work and Dr. Jackson had done some work, but um, it was uh, close to the deadline. There was not as much of an opportunity to discuss um, some of the things that I think we would have liked to have discussed and had a more robust um, conversation around whether or not that was something that we were gonna be inclined to do. Um, speaking for myself and some of the other people on the board who might not be on the board anymore because there's been some turnover, there were some concerns around some of the things that people have raised here as issues and we'll continue to evaluate that. You know, from a town perspective, uh, there's a lot of competing, uh, there's a lot of competition for scarce resources and there's a lot of conversations around the uh, new water treatment plant. There's conversations around the work that might need to be done at the DPW um, garage, if you will. There's uh, some work that needs to be done at the water foundry, and unfortunately, as you're hearing here tonight, a lot of these projects uh, tend to be expensive, they tend to be big projects, they, they tend to have a lot involved with them. So, uh, much like the board here, much like the school committee here, we're always evaluating all the options to see what projects are in the pipeline, prioritizing, just like these guys do here, what's the project here that needs to kind of keep things moving, and we're always going through the same thing on our end. So, we'll continue to do that, and we'll continue to have this discussion and have this dialogue as it relates to schools and all the other resources in town. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Vinny Alwani, uh, Five Manchester Circle. So I wanna just start off by thanking Joan and everybody else on the uh, school committee. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jackson, for everything that you guys have been doing. I know it's not an easy task. Um, I will say, I, I, I think it's definitely a no-brainer. Um, so I agree with that. I have a eighth grader and I have a junior right now in the school system. So I know I'm not gonna benefit from this, but that's not what this is about, right? This is about, if you think back 50 years when people were making that same decision, it wasn't about their kids, it was about what we needed to do because of the length of these projects. So um, definitely think it's a no-brainer. Key questions that I had were, you know, if we look at some of the other towns around us, they've probably gone through similar things. We look at uh, Medway, we look at Franklin, they both have, you know, new high school. So we've got some reference points, and I'm assuming that they went through a similar process, right? It's great to see what Massachusetts will kick in to help us out with this process. So when we think about, you know, potentially what the time frame may be, Dr. Jackson, is that kind of taking into account what your counterparts at Medway or Franklin have taken it, you know, have gone through. I think it would be good to know that. And then also as part of that, I think what's exciting is when we start to think about what the school could be going forward, right? We've got so many options, so many ideas of what the school of the future could be. And so it's really important to have the feedback from the Massachusetts Council around what they're seeing, right? So we're not necessarily trying to put things in, envisioning what it might be. And then also even looking at folks that have taken the plunge. So in Medway, they've taken the plunge. Franklin, they've taken the plunge. It'd be great whether now or you know, sometime as we move forward in the process to be able to go in and visit them, see some of the common decisions that they had, and then saw how those came into, you know, into fruition and reality as well, too. So just in terms of time frame, the time frames I quoted to you are based on uh, averages from uh, most high school projects in this area. In the past decade, Hoppington, Ashland, Medway, um, Natick, um, and I'm missing one off the top of my head, um, you know, have Bellingham. built new, have, uh, Franklin, Franklin, as you mentioned, have built new high schools. Um, and they take, um, they took quite a few years. I know Franklin took three years, and they had an overcrowding problem in Franklin, and they, Franklin has, was a community that was experiencing significant growth. Um, so um, the needs are difficult to compare sometimes, um, but there are n a number of very high quality state of the art high schools um, touching our borders um, yeah. that, um, that I get an opportunity to visit all the time. My colleagues, um, we visit each other often. Ms. Bottomley, who's the high school principal, who's here tonight, 
um, has very close collegial relationships with those folks as well, um, and we're in their buildings all the time. Natick High School is actually a, um, a um, MSBA, um, I'm trying to think of the word, um, uh, sample uh, model, model school um, that um, Co uh, Wilmington High School just built uh, based on the Natick model. So um, there, there are some extremely high quality projects that have taken place locally. The time, the time frame has been three to five years to get into the mix. Um, I, um, and so I, you know, I'm, I, I have a lot, I, th I have some good data to support some of those assertions. Again, it does depend on who, who um, submits every year. Um, you know, the numbers I gave you, 100 to 120 were true, but this year it was 78. So um, it's, it's somewhat hard to predict. Hi, oh, Meg Johnson, 20 Granite Street. Um, sort of tying to the, the Natick High School comment, I know when we were first looking for a community to buy our house, settle into, um, we were very turned off by the high school and, and, and Natick and, and some of the surrounding towns. So we um, wanted to choose a town that invested in the schools and, and viewed that as a priority. And so, again, I have younger children, not sure if they'll see the benefit uh, or not, but um, certainly when it comes time for us all to s perhaps sell our house, downsize, it will be nothing but benefit um, that even if this hasn't been completed, every you know, potential buyers know at least it is in the works. Um, given the, the process, the you know, annual submission, everybody goes into the pool each year, um, ostensibly the worst cases are selected and, and that group gets um, pulled from the pool. Do we have, a, and, and there's some, in, some um, allusion to the fact it will likely take several rounds. And I think management of that expectation will be important to communicate because to the average person, oh, we didn't get selected, obviously our needs aren't that bad, you know. Um, do we have a sense of where we stack up as far as building age and need? Because I, when you look at the list of, of hit points, we don't seem to tick that many boxes of those boxes on its face, and I'm sure severity factor into that. So I'm, I'm guessing all of this research has been done, <laughs> and there's some rough sense of where we may stack up an estimated cycle. Well, I, I think you have to look at um, some of the data we have from area communities, Hoppington and the, their high school prior to the new build, Natick and their high school prior to the new build, Franklin, Medway, um, et cetera, Ashland. Um, they, um, they are, I know the Ashland school was about the same age as this is now when they replaced it um, with Ashland High School. So um, on the other hand, you know, I've been in like, uh, I, I live up in the Merrimack Valley, so I know Stoneham High School very well, and it took six years, and I find that astounding because that was a school that, you know, the best thing to do would be to rub two sticks together and start all over. I mean, that was in that bad a shape, and it took them six years. I don't know if their statement of interest was poorly written or what, but, you know, it took them longer than I expected. Um, Chelmsford High School, uh, as I read in the Lowell Sun, didn't get selected this year. They've had some overcrowding issues in Chelmsford, and I was quite surprised they didn't get selected. There's also the issue about they only have so much money, so it's not about just about um, numbers, but it's about money. So if they do more elementary schools, they can do more projects. If they do more elementary schools that have a lower reimbursement rate, they can do more projects. Um, Lawrence High School, for example, when it was built, which was under the old program, um, the, which is was, um, which is discontinued, but um, Lawrence High School was paid entirely by the state. So a lot of the urban schools, and there have been some new ones, Chelsea High School's brand new, they just opened this year, um, they were paid 90 plus percent by the state. So one or two of those projects basically chews up the whole, um, the whole pot for a year. So there's a number of factors, and I'm, I would love to be able to s clearly set everybody's expectation. Um, and, you know, I, 
I guess in one way I'd like nothing better than to be wrong and have it come out and get accepted in the first year, but I professional, my professional opinion is that isn't going to happen. I believe Wellesley High School chose not to go through MSBA because they didn't want to wait, so they ended up paying for it all out of their own. Um, and and so, just you know, it, it, you know, it's it's a thought process. It's a thought process on the resources. Some towns don't want to wait for those resources, and they have the resources to do it their own way without having to meet their requirements or the limitations of the process. So again, um, not suggesting that we'd be building a Newton North or Wellesley High School here, but that does go to show you two other comparable towns that value education and the routes that they took, just for context. Jay, can we skip? <laughs> I think he's having a seizure over there. Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Elizabeth O'Neill. I graduated in 2017 and I live just over in the Mark Tree neighborhood. Um, I know it's not particularly relevant to what we're currently discussing, but I don't know how much of a priority it is, but as a recent student, I just want to talk about my experiences with the parking lot, um, especially in the winter. Um, the plowing job isn't necessarily great and it becomes really crowded because students can't see the parking spaces. There's a lot of sh slippage. I know someone who um, it was too icy and they ran into a pole and there was some damage to the car. And just that's just one of the problems, um, especially in the spring when a lot of sophomores get their licenses, they don't start paying for parking passes. And so um, there's kind of an issue with overcrowding and so a lot of the overflow goes into the March Free neighborhood. I don't know how recently the police have been cutting in on that, but they all park along one road and you can't see if cars are coming. And so back when I walked home, there would be students speeding. There would be a lot of almost accidents that I could see happening really fast because they're all trying to pull out at once. And it's just, I don't know how much of a priority it'll be in the like slow rebuilding effort, but it's just something that you should consider, I don't know. Oh, and also for internships and senior projects, a lot of students have to leave. Yeah. And so there's an issue with getting to class on time for their next block because they can't find a parking spot. And so some people have gotten in trouble because they pulled into teacher parking spots because there's just no spot. And at that point, they're like 10 minutes late to class. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Lisa Brown, 145 Hollis Street. Um, so what I'm hearing, and, and I wanted to clarify something Stacy had said, your children are the same age as my younger guy, so I have a third grader and a seventh grader, and it sounds like in the long term, we're thinking that this is like 10 years off. Like, so if we are thinking we're 50 years in now, what are we gonna look like 10 years from now? So what I wanted to ask, I have within the last year been in Lincoln Sudbury High School, been in Wayland High School, been in Hopkinton High School. They are amazing. And then you walk in here. It feels like a different planet. So we have Holliston Innovates, right? And everybody's so excited about our models of we're gonna be more project-based and more student-centered. We ain't built for that. And so I think my question is around, I, every town meeting, I look at the number that like Keefe and VOCAD and where our school choice money is getting away from us and then what's coming back because it's in the budget. Are we starting to lose out here? Are we starting to see that other towns are getting ahead of us and we're gonna see some real financial impacts of school choice going the wrong way? It's already declining. We, we could and I, I can't predict the future, but yes, you are seeing that um, I think with the Keefe Tech enrollment, I think um, students are st or families are starting to choose that that is an option and a viable option for people. Um, and there's something to be said about the trades. And I think we sort of lost sight of that over the past 10, 15 years. And so I think you're seeing some mind shift on that. Um, I don't want to speculate, but yeah, we could be in danger of, of falling behind the curve. So we need a plan. 
I'm, I'm actually that's concerned about that as a as a real estate agent because when I take out millennial couples and they want they're looking at Ashland and Medway and um, you know Hopkin in um, they all have new high schools and here's what I'm really worried about and I'm going to be very blunt here we as a philosophy as a district have taken the the handcuffs of MCAS preparation off of our academics, off of our faculty, because we feel like that is the wave of the future that's better learning. Who cares if they can recite the presidents? Like it, it, it's important, but it's not, it's not rote memory. And so with the lower emphasis on MCAS preparation, our test scores may reflect that. We are very comfortable with that. But when I'm taking out a couple and they're looking at metrics, they're looking at that. So like, oh, their scores are okay and they're a level here. They've got French immersion. They've got Montessori. But ah, look at that beautiful Ashland High School and it's a green school. And do you see what I'm saying? Like it is, it is a it is a very big concern for me. I think that Holliston has a superior school system to all of that because of the things I've just said. Um, one more footnote to what we were talking about about maintenance. If we weren't really taking care of our buildings and grounds, these things like the boilers and the field would not have outlived their shelf life. So we're taking care of the things that matter. Thank you. Yeah, I think this, the facts kind of speak for themselves. Um, you could probably talk to this, Keith, but our school choice numbers have definitely declined, and they declined as our neighboring communities have improved their own facilities over time. And that's just that's just simple fact, right? So we used to be heavily on the receiving end of students from Hopkinton. We are no longer. Um, same thing is true from uh, Medway, and I think we had saw a lot from Bellingham at one point. We still receive students from these districts. Um, often it's because they're um, seeking out Montessori or French immersion, um, but you know even that's getting more challenging because we still charge tuition for kindergarten where none of our neighboring communities do, um, and that's a whole nother ball of wax. That's another night. But, um, but the numbers speak for themselves on this, and it is a concern. Uh, this is on. Uh, Dave Gonzalez, 43 Apple Yard Lane. I've got a, um, a senior, a uh, sophomore who's actually in a private school, and an eighth grader, so I will not see any of the new high school. Um, just a few things. I'm a little familiar with the MSBA. Um, they just came out with a study. A report back in 2017. In 2016, they inspected all the public high public, total public schools in Massachusetts. Um, it took about three months to do, and a report came out in 2017. It's on their website, and it rates all the schools for certain metrics for the building, the facility of how they educate people, and for their maintenance. I, I really strongly recommend everybody take a look at that on their website. Uh, a lot of work went into that. Um, report and it'll really give you a good feel for all the schools that are around in the area of how they rate and it's not just high schools it's elementary schools it's middle schools um, and it does a rating so you'll see what different um, schools in the area rate at um, another thing is i'm pretty sure that the msba does not pay for fields um, for tennis courts or for um, turf fields so if we're thinking about waiting 10 years to replace that turf field think again that thing needs to be replaced very soon um, it has outlived its useful life. My kids play sports all over the state, and that field is one of the worst in the whole state for an athletic field. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Your point is well taken. Timing is an issue, and as I said earlier, there's no question that some of the items on the list that Dr. Jackson presented, we will absolutely need to invest in prior to the completion of this process. Having said that, we don't know what's going to get added to this list as each year passes, so it's a valid point. Um, Jillian McCauley, 544 Central Street. Sorry, did you? Need no, to go? No, go, Jilly. Okay. Uh, my question and also concern is, do we know at this point, is it too early to begin thinking about what the state of learning will be like for the students in the high school as when and if the work 
begins. Um, I have a kindergartner and a third grader currently. It sounds somewhat likely that one or both of them will be high schoolers when this work is undertaken, um, especially if we need to build a brand new high school altogether. Where will these students be learning? What will the environment be like as construction goes on? Presumably it can't all happen over the course of a summer or even two summers when students aren't on the premises. What can we expect? Um, it seems um, concerning that potentially four years worth of um, a student's time might be severely impacted just for the benefit of those coming after them. So I suppose that's my question slash concern. And it's an uh, understandable and reasonable concern. Um, and um, and I, I, it's way too early in this process to offer anything in terms of an answer to that. Um, during the process, I mean, this process, I wanna kind of pull us back a little bit. We're, there are people who are advocating a solution in this room. I'm not advocating a solution. I'm advocating su su submitting a problem to the MSBA and having them help us figure out what the solutions are. So it may be that it's a project that can be done over several summers in a row. It may be a project that we build a new school next door and then and don't use athletic fields for two years and then tear this one down and build um, and build athletic fields here. I mean, there's there's a whole range of possibilities. When the feasibility study is completed, there will be an analysis of the impact, but not only in terms of dollars and cents, but in terms of um, impact on the instructional environment during the construction period as well. And that's part of the conversation that will take place and part of the input that the community would have during the, during the, the um, discussion where the community selects their preferred solution. So um, I, um, you know, that is a real and an and a important issue. Um, I managed the uh, an occupied addition renovation project at Algonquin Regional High School in Northboro and Southboro. It took three and a half years. The building was occupied the entire time. Um, you build some, you move people, you build a little extra, you move people. It's, it takes longer, it's more expensive. Um, but the kids do adapt in the construction part of it. Some of it that you just have to do in the summer as well. So those projects, those things would be worked out as part of a, of a comprehensive solution. But again, I think we're putting the cart before the horse just a little bit here. What I'm trying to convince this community to do and um, is to submit a statement of interest. And respectfully, while you know, I respect the fact that there are other priorities in this community. I know there are libraries. I know there's DPW facilities. I know there's police stations and fire stations and other infrastructure that are critically important to providing the services to this community. I'm paid to advocate for the schools. And ultimately, I think the school committee and the board of selectmen would agree that it is up to the voters to set the priorities for this community, not for the school committee to set the priorities for this community, and not for the board of selectmen to set the priorities for this community. It's up to the voters. And I just want to be able to have the information ready for the voters of this community when they need to make a decision about is it, are we gonna invest in water infrastructure? Are we gonna invest in a DPW garage? Are we gonna invest in a library? Are we gonna invest in a new, in a new or a renovated um, high school? Those, we need to have all that data so you as a community can make that decision. And the statement of interest to me is the way we go about and make sure that you've got good data to make decisions. Uh, hi, Mike Marino, 65 uh, Woods Crossing. Dr. Jackson literally just said just about everything I was gonna say. 
Uh, when I got up, I've got a kindergartner and a, um, and a four-year-old. <laughs> well, I, again, my point being only when we heard um, Mr. Marsden, I think it was, from the, the, um, the schools, the, 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 uh, rather the selectmen, um, the first half of the argument that it was maybe a little bit quick last year, okay, I, I understand that, but the second half of the argument when we start talking about competing for resources and DPW, we're literally competing for zero resources at this point. There's not a single cent other than Dr. Jackson's time required to submit this. And so I, I, don't, I don't think that part of the argument holds water. So I hope that with a little bit more time this year and hopefully that conversation in front of the selectmen as well that we're able to, to move this forward to Dr. Jackson's second point a second ago, that is eventually when we do need to compete for those resources, we need to know what those resources are, what dollar amounts we're talking about and fit those into the priorities. And given the relatively long runway we're talking about here, I, I just don't see the downside of, of moving forward, so I support the, the school board's vote, and uh, I imagine they have a public forum for the, the town selectmen as well, so I, I hope we get a lot of that coming forward, because I just, uh, yeah, I just don't see the downside of the, of the forward motion. So, thank you. Thank you. So we are at 9 o'clock, and you have all been sitting here listening to us. Um, I really want to make sure people feel heard, so if you have a question or a comment, I encourage you to um, to ask us. I'll hand it over to you after. Uh, Sean McIntyre, uh, 645 Highland Street. Um, my question is, and I know we kind of touched on it earlier, so I don't want to be you know the guy that disrupts the room, but is there any other way besides the MSBA and self-funding to get this project going? Those are the two options. Those were the two. No. Those, were the two those are the only two options in the state. Unless Bill, so Ga unless Bill Gates is moving, unless Bill Gates is moving into town and wants to donate the other new school high schools go through MSBA. Every, other than every, the two other, that other than Wellesley, other than Wellesley, every other program. I mean, you're crazy to, you know, to leave even a two million dollar septic system. Hey, I'm just more on the timeline. The to get 31 percent. And my kids. Yeah. I guess they're kind of middle-aged, well, so it's a, they won't benefit. Eight. It's a you I'm know, for them. it's a sizable amount of money. I got you. My and, second question, and, and it also provides you with a significant amount of support and um, and a perspective that I can't offer you. I am. My focus is this community. I've been working here for 15 years. While I do know my colleagues and know their schools well, the MSBA provides you, and the taxpayers, with a much broader view on your need as compared to other communities. Um, and I just think is a provide you with object. I'm not objective. I'll be the first to admit. It. If you want me to. Um, that's not what you pay me for, frankly. I'm here to advocate for the schools. And um, so I'm not objective, but the MSBA is. And I think that provides many taxpayers with a lot of comfort. Right, my second question, I know this is, you know, far down the path, but, you know, if it ended up being a rebuild, there would probably be, you know, what, what site in town would that be? Would it be in the fields? And then what other schools have done, but with the list that you have of stuff that needs to be upgraded, is there thoughts that, all right, let's go forward and maintain this school for all the children that need to go in it every year and the athletic fields, and maybe we can find some committee together to get moving on the athletic fields now, and then a rebuild, if that happens, will be on a different site, and we could have another use for this site and not waste our money in upgrading it year over year right now. So we have the community, uh, the um, capital improvement plan that is sort of spearheaded by the finance committee and they have um, involved us in that and so many of those items, I feel like that entire list that Brad showed um, are on that capital improvement plan. So it's, it is discussion that is happening um, about where we prioritize some of those things. I do, I wanna um, address what I think, I think you're asking is, you know, until if and when there's a plan for this facility, we are committed to maintaining it. There is no question about that. Um, it's in the best interest of our students and that's really where it starts, but it's in the best interest of the community. With respect to um, an alternate site, 
That's a complicated question and the one that does go back to the Board of Selectmen because it comes down to land availability in the town, um, which quite frankly I think is pretty limited. Um, there are lots, if you will, that have come up over time, but it's a complicated process. You have to take into account you know, the need for the footprint, the size, the cost of purchasing that land, as well as evaluating the appropriateness in terms of its location for transporting students, et cetera. It's just like a whole big bee's nest. So, um, but depending on the timing and what, what potentially could come back from a feasibility study, whether we conduct it on our own or not, yeah, we'd have to look at all that. Mike DeFazio, 23 Jarbrook Road. Uh, I definitely agree with uh, moving forward with the SOI and uh, am happy to support the Board of Selectmen on decisions that need to be made for town improvements along with the school committee. Um, so in an effort to support both of those, has there, has there been any discussion? So I've been into, I've been on the field. I've been in the field house and I've been in the auditorium, but I did not attend Hollis in high school. I've never been in this school. Has there been any talk about offering tours to the public to, to see what th these ideas that have been talked about and, and right. what we're looking at? Yeah, that's, that's, a great that's, idea. A great that's, idea. A, that's an interesting suggestion. I think we'd be more than happy to do that. It, uh, we certainly, it. that's thank you. That's a great suggestion. Um, though they're typically done when there's a when there's a money decision mm -hmm. to be made as opposed to a non-money involved decision. But, um, you know, if we need to continue to keep the pressure on to, to make a non-money involved decision by, by, I mean, eventually the, you have to convince a much broader group of people than the 125 people who showed up here or whatever. There's less than that, but so, but that, I think we can make that available, sure. Um, Matt Coletti, 31 Summit Point Drive. I, too, support the initiative. Uh, appreciate a lot of the comments tonight, and I think um, the school would make this an appealing place to uh, live and work, would support uh, existing residential tax base, which is very important, uh, draw people to the community. But uh, going back to the question about affordability and alternative sources of financing, is there any thought, discussion, consideration, looking as far ahead as we are, as to any existing um, debt issuance that's coming to maturity and retiring and uh, setting aside those funds that might have already been allocated toward that. I know we struggle to maintain a strong credit rating. I imagine that's for a purpose. Uh, you know, issuing new debt, municipal bonds to fund a project like this, is that an option for financing when you're looking out as, as far as we are? So I'm going to um, try to address this and I want to do so with enormous respect for our finance committee because I think there is some confusion and maybe some concerns around the topic of debt retirement um, and how that may play into the timing um, for uh, the school committee um, suggesting that we pursue this process with a statement of interest. They are absolutely not tied together. Um, Point in fact, the town is retiring a significant portion of debt, and it's because um, our finance committee has been very responsible in how they've managed um, the paying of that debt, et cetera. Um, but that did not play into our decision to evaluate the situation. The single factor that influenced us was starting to look at the list, the growing list of needs. Um, that are going to be, that will need to be addressed in, um, in the next five to seven years, really. Um, how this all gets financed is to be determined. Ultimately, we have to first assess what we need and what project route we're going to pursue. And based on that, um, you know, we could all decide, we go through a feasibility to study and say, you know what? forget the whole thing. We're just going to keep trying to, through spit and bail wires, as Keith would say, keep these walls standing. Um, but whatever we pursue, it will go to a vote 
in the town, you'll have a recommendation from the finance committee about how best to finance that. Now, look, a project of this size, whether it's renovation or anything else, um, probably would be a debt uh, a debt-based program. Um, they're not going to pull cash out of the bank for it. So, uh, but it, but the two are sort of almost coincidental in terms of the timing. Does that help answer your question? It does. It, it seems coincidental yeah. in a good way. That if it's an opportunity to. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I, I was saying it seems coincidental in a good way. An opportunity to to look ahead and start allocating responsibly what we can with the forethought of the school in mind um, above, you know, considering that a priority early. Potentially. Just, just so you're aware, the debt that's being retired is linked to a, a bond exclusion proposition two and a half override. So that, that um, the levy, the, the amount of money the town can raised through taxation is reduced by the amount, automatically reduced by the amount of the debt retirement. So you can't keep your expenditures up here for no reason. The, 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 the amount that the, the town can raise through taxation is reduced by the amount of the, um, of the um, debt retirement. So right now, we're spending about 3.8, next, next fiscal year we're expected to be, pay about $3.8 million in, in bond payments for the renovations of all four schools. Um, in FY21, that's going to be down to $1.7 million. Um, in FY22, it's going to be $1.7 million. In FY23, it's going to be about $385,000 and will be zero in FY24. But what that will do is just reduce, not just, it'll reduce your taxes. So unless you have a project to fill in behind and a vote to approve that, the taxes go down automatically, which is the purpose of Prop 2 and a half. And you keep that the same for the next, for the next 30 years or whatever it happens to be, uh, and you do it to pay for a brand new school, uh, it, nobody's worse for the wear. Yeah, their taxes don't go down, but they don't go up. I think that would be kind of something that most people could support. Um, separately, the, school, the uh, schools were the only thing on the docket. Right. No, I, under, I understand. I understand. Um, <laughs> but yes, we. At, we at what it. point? <laughs> at what point do we find out what, like, as part of the feasibility study or whatever it is, or maybe it's step two or three in the process, do we get an approximate cost of building a new school? Yeah. Is that in the feasibility study, or is that further yeah, down the line? It comes out of that. It'll come out of that. Well, the, if the, it, final, the final doesn't come until, you know, the steps are eligibility, forming a project team, visibility study, schematic design, funding the project, detailed design. Right. So it's not until you get to that detailed design that you know to the penny. And then... Yeah, I'm not worried about to the penny. I'm right, thinking right. roughly, is it could be 40 million, 60 million. It'll be, of... it'll be that you'll have that figure as a result of the feasibility okay. study. You, you have to because the feasibility study will... Let's say it came out with three options. Um, do nothing, zero. Renovate, X. Rebuild, X plus Y. Okay, so it's got to give you some parameters to help the community make a decision. Okay, that, that was more my question is when does the community say, okay, it's going to cost us three or four million dollars a year in debt service payments to build a brand new school. We're not willing to do that, but we're willing to do X, Y, and Z. Right. Uh, but, okay. just, so, just so you're aware also, it could, the feasibility study will in all likelihood give you the whole gamut of options. The MSBA will also tell you we're not going to pay for that option right. or that option. We'll pay for that option on down. Right. Or we'll contribute to that option, not pay. No, they're not that paying. makes sense. That, that so makes they, sense. they have a say in this as well um, because they, well, they have more than their percentage, I assure you, because they're the state. But um, they will have a say in it as well. So, you know, they'll, it's, a, it's not just up to us to decide if we want to take their money understand. or, or take your money back, actually. And separately, I guess my, my original question was going to be after uh, piggybacking on that one was that if we decide to renovate, um, does that prohibit us from 
issuing other SOIs on the school to actually re rebuild. So let's say we decide we're going to renovate and it might you know, throw a Band-Aid on for the next 10 years, but we want to start the process on building a brand new school almost immediately thereafter because we know that it's a Band-Aid and it's only going to last 10 years. And if we think that it's only going to last 10 years or 15 or whatever it happens to be, um, and we know that the process is going to take 10 years to build a brand new school between four or five years waiting for your SOI to be accepted and then construction and so on and so forth, you're already at 10 more years. So if we were to say re to renovate, can we start an SOI right now also to rebuild? Is that allowed under the MSRA program? program? Does that make, I mean, Again, that the, right, the SOI, the, the SOI is actually a, just a statement of the problem and the feasibility study will give us all of our options. We ultimately, through a discussion with the MSBA and the community, um, and ultimately a vote of the board of directors of the MSBA and a vote of town meeting, and perhaps, and in all probability, through a debt exclusion vote through the town, there'll be a decision as to what option is chosen. But you're only going to get one bite at the apple. Okay. You're so not going to get to you can't renovate, renovate and, say, okay, and then 10 years from now, you 10 years from now, turn that around. And first of all, the bond would be longer than that, and um, so it's just you, you're going to have to pick a fork in the road coming up. I, just to be clear, when we submit a statement of interest, we're not submitting it for a renovation no, or I, I for a rebuild. Yeah, yeah okay, because we submit it and hope something good comes out. We don't know what comes out of that. Um, we could still renovate, but I would say it would be very unlikely the school would, uh, the district would invest significant money in renovation on our own until we know. Believe me, I'm, I'm yeah. completely on board with the brand new school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ben? Uh, uh, ben Sparrow, 1460 Highland. Um, I'm also on the finance committee. Um, so I have two questions, I guess. Um, the first is, have we looked at um, facilities that could be multi-use, like for example, something that could the seniors can use, or uh, you know something like that that could that could be helpful to you know for some of the other uh, buildings in uh, in town. I know like the senior center is a little older, or you know it, have we looked at anything like that? Um, and then my second question, it's kind of a comment, um, I guess, kind of a question is, so the debt's coming off on the other schools that we've. Uh, that we built 20 years ago. Um, you know, as we go forward in this process, we want to make sure that we're not forgetting about those schools and making sure that we have a sort of a bigger plan to make sure that all of our facilities are working and then as soon as the high school is done, let's say hypothetically in 10 years, then suddenly we need a new middle school. You know, we want to make sure that the plan sort of takes into account all of the facilities that we have and not just looking exclusively at the high school, which may be an important part of it, but just are we looking at everything um, together as we build the plan for the town? As part of the capital planning, we look at everything, right? So in that context, we consider our investments for each of the buildings. Um, of which there are four for you, for those of you who don't know. Um, but the statement of interest will focus specifically and exclusively on the high school because that's the project we would be looking for state participation on. It doesn't preclude us examining our investments in the other schools. Um, and then your first question, Ben, multi-use. Um, that is probably... It's a great question, um, maybe a little premature. If there's interest in that, I think you know we'd be open to it and certainly welcome input from other departments, whether it's the seniors or the library or what have you. Um, Multi-use facilities can be fantastic. They just require extra planning, especially because then you have um, adults potentially or other people in town or from the public coming into a school facility so it has to be safe and secure. So we just have to consider when and how that multi-use occurs mm -hmm. but I think we're open to anything at this point. That's good questions. Have a mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
can answer a lot of those questions or at least address them because I was on the finance committee in 2000. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I was on the committee, the finance committee, when, this, when these projects were put together and, and financed and whatnot. Uh, but really what I wanted to, uh, I said another suggestion, there's a great suggestion over here, um, and to Dr. Jackson's point, he's not impartial, we get that. And as a, a resident, I think if we do move forward with, um, uh, with what you're suggesting here, is that we come up with, or you, we have an impartial committee that's not school committee driven, that's not finance driven, but maybe a little bit of everything. Yeah. So mm -hmm. people out here can say, okay, this is, suggestion from or uh, hearing from an impartial group makes a big difference. Yeah, I think we welcome that. Yeah. Um, I think the student left, but just on the, on the uh, fields, on the, the turf, just to, again, put it in perspective, this turf was put in the same year that Marshall Street was put in. In fact, they got a discount because they did them both at the same time. Marshall Street doesn't get half the use that this got and they replaced it last year, just putting in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, did HISA pay for that? No, um, it was funded, I don't know if HISA did it, no it wasn't HISA, it was all done through private, no, that's all private funded. Um, my point is the useful life oh, is definitely absolutely. I was just curious. Did expired, they, did they get it out of the town? and it's a safety oh, issue too, they, to someone's, they, um, it's, it's they, a big safety issue, but. It's a safety issue, they charge right. right. Yep. Oh, yeah. And to the woman in the corner over there about, you know, how do you handle the, the students when the projects are going on? Um, I know the town, in back-to-back -back years, renovated Andrews, built Placentino, and then did the high school three or five years in a row, whatever it took, I can't remember. And they did move the students around and they, they do adapt. They, they do, it does work. I'm not saying that's the solution going forward, but they do. Um, and it's taken into consideration. I know back then it was. Well, I think on that point, it, and I could be wrong, you could maybe add some color to this, but my understanding is most of these projects, even the major ones, do not exceed one year. And I appreciate that's not insignificant, but it's not typically like their entire high school experience would be disrupted. You got it, you're not talking to my yep. I'm not talking, um, typically they're one year projects and not multi-year projects. So um, their entire experience would not be disrupted and hopefully it would be less than that, so. The other thing I would add, again, just for the town, uh, not necessarily the schools, is again, in my ten uh, tenure there, Jay was there, part of it, and John as well. Um, we did three schools. The next year we did the police, uh, the fire station. The next year we did the police station. The next year we did the town hall. There was 10 years where there was a project every year. I know the water treatment facility was sprinkled in there a little bit. I don't recall many large projects in the last X number of years. And no. so one of the things we brought up at the time, suggestion, and I don't know if it's been done recently, is a 20 year plan for the yeah. town. Yeah. You know, these one, you know, this is a large project, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think the town would, again, feasibility for the town projects is something that we need to do so we don't have, to someone's point, okay, what happens to the other schools? Right. Does this one go and then two years later we need this one? If we can spread them out, all the better. Um, so that was another suggestion back in the years ago. Um, I know a study was done, but I'm not sure if anything's been done since then. Again, it's a town question, not a school question, so I don't expect you to have the answer to that. So, and on the financing side, I do recall, I think the total amount of debt, the total amount of the projects, the school projects was 77 million, this being 26 of it. Um, and keep in mind, the reimbursement rate was 68%, something like that. Yeah. This is 33%. Mm -hmm. Just putting it in perspective, I don't know what the dollars so amount. Minimum 31. Minimum 31, again, I'm just, put, just putting it in Lawrence perspective. Get 98, we'll get 34. Right, but back then it was you know seventy to ninety or yeah. even a hundred. I mean, it's yeah. it's the old pro it's the old. It, this is different. Just putting it in perspective, I have yeah. no idea what the cost is. Of course, the cost today is more than it was then, but that just might help you put it in the perspective. That's all. Thank you. That I really appreciate your perspective. I, thank you. Just to f to follow up on your initial comment, one of the the MSBA requires 
that a school building committee be established um, independent of the school committee, uh, much like the school building committee that ran the four projects that you were alluding to, they were a separate board, um, and um, that, that structure is required eventually, and actually will work through the feasibility process as well. It actually needs to be established um, early on in the process. It's well. We I think Halston has a charter as defines the school building or building committees in its charter. I'm not sure that may not be true, but it's typically the last one was. Um, I don't remember. I don't know. I wasn't here, so I don't know how it was appointed. But it's not. It's not the school committee is not the school building committee, and nor is the Thank board of God. selectmen the school building committee. So it's it's a group of um, of interested citizens. They're. Um, the superintendent's typically on it. There may be a school committee rep or two, maybe a rep from the Board of Selectmen or FinCon. We just took all of your names. <laughs> Hi, um, Islin Weaver, 69 Woodland Street. My question is how many, because you're expecting to get rejected, you said, you know, four to five times. How many times after that before you say, okay, they're not gonna accept us, we need to figure out how we're gonna pay for this? I'm expecting to be rejected. It sounds my, like my high school life before prom. <laughs> um, I, um, I estimate it's gonna take three to five years. Um, so, if we get, sorry. so if we get to that five year mark and we still haven't been chosen, is that when we as a town say, okay, we got to figure out how we're going to pay for this on our own, or are, you, are we still submitting every year? I think, well, I think each, each submission requires a new vote of the Board of Selectmen and the school committee. So there's an opportunity, if, you, if, we, if we submit this year, if the Board of Selectmen votes to give me permission to submit, and we submit and we're not successful, I will again petition the school committee um, it's likely, depending on the, the feedback we get from the SBA, the MSBA, but um, in f this time next year for the same thing, and the, then that existing school committee and the existing board of selectmen will have to approve it again. So it gives us the opportunity to ask this question every year: Are we, you know, do we, we'll, we'll have the results of the previous review and um, rejection, and um, we can you know, make a decision, the community can make another decision, um, and whether we choose a different path and say, you know what, this is just doesn't look like it's in the cards, we gotta choose another direction. But until we at least get one bite at the apple, um, it seems to me we need, that, we need that feedback before we can make a lot of decisions about which, which road is best to take. Are there any other questions? Okay. Sure. Is this the first time we've discussed doing an SOI at all? Oh, sorry, in the, in the 15 years since this program has been in existence, is this the first time we've talked about doing an SOI, or has it happened in the past? Right, Brad, you haven't requested an SOI. We, um, well, I, I requested an SOI last year for this project, um, and that's the first, um, Okay. First time, and Holliston essentially in the existence of the MSBA has not made a request okay. of the MSBA. We have not made one request. Um, so I'm huh. kind, I do have some hope that they're going to say, oh, Holliston, I, we never heard from them. I mean, I look at it, we're paying for it. We've been paying for it for, again, this program's been in existence 15 years, so everybody's paid sales tax for the past 15 years. Work we're kind of due. We're owed something here, so <laughs> yeah. may as well take advantage. So our next step is we are going to work with the um, board of selectmen to get on their agenda um, because we would like for them um, to take a vote, but we wanted to have community input first. Um, so please uh, keep your eyes open if you want to be part of our newsletter. Um, please reach out to one of us um, to get you on there. Um, and you will see posts from us through the reporter and on Facebook posts and on our um, district web page. So on behalf of the committee, I really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you for coming out. Um, and we hope to see you at some of our school committee meetings. Our next one is next Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Good night, everyone. Thank you.